Hey, it's Jason Scott Montoya. I'm here with my old friend from Arizona, Matthew J. Diaz. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we actually kind of recently reconnected after some stuff I was posting on Facebook. Um, but we actually met, uh, we went to the same high school, um, didn't quite run in the same circles. You were a grade older, I believe than me, yeah. but you were friends with my sister. Your sister. Yeah. Yeah. And we, there was a Bible study I visited a few times that I think, uh, you were a part of as well. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was in Arizona. I've moved to Atlanta and you're still there. So Tell me about you and where you're living now, and I think you've got a new book coming out or just come, that had just come out, so tell us about that as well. Yeah, thank you so much for um, taking the time to, to talk to me. Um, yeah, since uh, high school, I have stayed in Arizona, briefly lived in Colorado for about a year, and then, then came back. And Which, which part? Uh, Colorado Springs. Okay, yeah. There, uh, uh, going to school, I went to Denver Seminary for about a semester okay then moved back and now i'm down in phoenix yeah um, where it's hot it's starting to get hot so yeah we had thought about phoenix but we picked atlanta instead <laughs> yeah. humid though right it is it is I, which i do like some people don't they, they prefer the dryness but <laughs> i just don't like heat either yeah. way <laughs> yeah um, but uh, it's phoenix but yeah yeah phoenix it's i guess it's like one of the fastest growing cities okay yeah wow in, and then I'm like, if, if a million other people can live here, I guess I can suck it up for yeah. a little bit until um, God moves me elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I wrote, I just uh, released a book, um, self-published yeah. about my school. Um, I work at a private Christian school, grades, birth all the way to 12th. Um, and they do a, a summer reading plan. And, and my superintendent said, hey, if you ever actually write that book, we'd love to you know, work with you on that. Okay, and, awesome. Of promoting it, so I finally wrote it and and published it and got it ready in time for our teacher appreciation, which was last week, and got the okay. book into their hands, which was yeah. a huge, huge deadline. It's called the last day of regret, and it is a period of uh, fifteen years um, about my sister Hannah, who passed yeah. away when she was twenty-four. Yeah, it was November thirteen. And so the book covers the time span of the 10 years um, before she died. And then that week of, of her death and my reflection of that, because um, there's the day that she died. And then the week later is when we had the, the service for her. And so through mm -hmm. kind of the second half of the book, I, I go back and forth on reflecting okay. uh, 10 years of her yeah. life. And what um, was your relationship? Was she an older or a younger sister? Younger, yeah. She's my younger sister by about four years. Okay. Uh, and the youngest in the family or what? And the youngest child in your family? Yeah, she's the youngest. Yeah, she was our, so there's four older one, me and three older. And then Hannah was our, our half sister on my okay. mom's. Yeah. So, um, her passing, I mean, obviously dealing with death in, in general is, is hard mm -hmm. and, and difficult. Um, but there are some very specific things that, that stood out, um, to me. I, I don't know if there were, I don't know, you call them revelations or visions or, or just uh, maybe discernment into, into that period that um, after thinking about it for several years, I'm like, you know, I, I, think, I, I think I got a story that mm. I'd want to share. And so I wrote part of it down, you know, about a month after she passed away and then I slowly worked on it over time. And then last year, um, well, a year ago, April, I, I gave part of it to our uh, junior English teacher here. Okay. We used to edit professionally, and I was like, hey, is this something that's worth my time? Yeah. Or is this just for me and my family? Because if it's just for me, then I'm going to keep taking my time. And, and yeah. she read it and loved it and was like, I, I really would like to know more if you want to keep mm -hmm. you know, writing. And how much time was between when you gave it to her and, and when your sister passed? Um, it had been four and a half years. Okay when I gave it to her. Um, and again, that was, I probably had maybe, you know, 20%, 25%. Mm -hmm. And what she told me was, um, this is a great story. Just keep writing. Don't self edit, just yeah. write and write See and where write. It, where it takes you. Yeah. And that was I mean, the best advice she could have given me. Cause I didn't know, you know, where to go. And, and as soon yeah. as I had that bug a few weeks later, <laughs> that was my, my grandma passing away, um, mm -hmm. April. And then as soon as that happened, I just, I knew what I needed the, I needed to fill in the gaps, you know, the beginning, yeah. how the beginning, how the end, 
I just need to write everything in the middle. Yeah. So I spent about two months coming home every night and just writing, writing, writing. Um, and then I had the book that actually is finishes maybe about 60% of what I originally wrote. Um, okay. A ton of stuff so that we could focus. So it was on much that. longer is what you're saying? Yeah, it's very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you told me to write everything. So I'm really, like yeah. down to the minute detail. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's great. So who, like, what's, uh, who, who's the person that ought to read this book? And, and what is, what's the, really the hook that pulls them in to go, you know what, this might be something you were, you would want to read. I mean, I think the title, The Last Day of Regret is a, is a big indicator. It's like, man, that's, that's a pretty provocative message. Yeah. Um, and all of us have regrets in different ways. So, so kind of give us a little insight and in who, who ought to check out the book. Yeah. And what's, what's interesting about that question is that I'm finding that the audience is, is much bigger than I had anticipated mm. that are people that are reading it or that I've asked to read it are taking away different components of it. Yeah. Depending on, on their own experience. So initially I, I wrote it so that people could understand, um, one that, that just, because you're a Christian or a pastor or mm -hmm. a Bible teacher, which is me, doesn't mean that that I behave you know, perfectly. Yeah. Um, and so I'm very transparent in my mistreatment of my sister. Um, and transparent in in that that's a lot of my regret is that I, I wish I would have mm -hmm. changed uh, yeah. the way that I, I behaved towards her. And so then in dealing with her death, um, it realizing oh that was a lot of you know missed opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and you so, can take it back. I mean, you can, yeah, you can that, change and then for the future, because there was yeah. no future in her that, case. Yeah. That, that this is the one permanent thing that we can't, um, that we can't fix. And so, you know, along with my faith um, and, and really wanting to kind of tie all that together. So whether someone has, has faith in God or not, or, or has faith in general, whether they've dealt with death before or not, yeah, uh, they, there's definitely the dynamic of family relationships within it. Yeah. Um, dysfunctional family relationships uh, and, and regrets that we have with that, what, you know, the, the, how we wish we, we could do things differently or better, mm -hmm. but really validating all those things, validating that, that death is difficult, validating the family relationships are difficult, um, validating that, that, that life throws these unexpected curveballs um, and, and being able to take a step back and say, okay, here is a person's story. And, and he's explaining how all the curveballs kind of connected together that I, I and, and did you feel like completely unprepared for any of those curveballs? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it, I go, I talk about my my wife and I having a miscarriage at some point in there. Um, a, a lot of different. I mean, and that was one thing that I I had her read and reread and say, you know, how much can I share? What do you want me to share? And so yeah. I let her kind of you know guide me in that and yeah. Um, stuff about my stepdad mm -hmm. that I like to read and say, you know, how much do you want me to share about that? Because again, I wrote everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please help me filter <laughs> what, it. <laughs> what are you comfortable with me sharing? And so, and my publisher had to get, I had to get, you know, uh, things notarized by them. Saying For that permission, a yeah. Story. So I think they did a good job in helping me, you know, guide me in that. So, yeah. Um, so, so he, yeah. Loss, lo loss or not, if anything, a, a story about family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now the title, the the last day of regret. Uh, where does that come from? I mean, the thing that comes to my mind is you know all these interviews that have been done on people on their deathbeds, and they sort of look back at their life and share their regrets. Yeah. But, you know, where where does the name specifically come from? Yeah, I think the 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 catch of of the name, and without spoiling uh, too much, is is that I want I want for you to have in your mind anything and everything. So. Yeah. Last thing I read for you is that is that the deathbed scenario? Yeah. Uh, is it the question of 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 when? When is there a last day of bread? Is there a last day mm. of bread? Um, and one of the chapter titles is the first day of regret, um, and then the last one is last day of regret. And so I I very much wanted to kind of draw on both death and regret and um, yeah, but I don't want to answer the question. It's a question, and I and I answer it. Um, in the book and and but it's kind of one of those I want you to search it and find it and figure out you know for yourself what what is it for you I explain what it is for me um, yeah. and but then I allow for there to be some room for mm -hmm. you know 
for yeah, people. yeah, that's interesting. Just allowing the title to sort of meet people where they are, but also playing yeah. with in a way to entice them in and, and have it relevant to their own life. Yeah, definitely. Well, and the, and the if you have a chance to get the book cover, I think it's on my my yeah. website. Yeah, I'll pull it off of there for for the on the I'll put it posted on the blog post there's here. A lot of, there's a lot of puzzles within the cover. I had a, a, a former student. I gave her several pictures of my sister's tattoos. Oh, right. okay. So the butterflies and the these dove looking things in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. That all that there's a giant kind of Ethiopian cross in the background. Yeah. And so all that is is stuff that is explained within the book as it goes. Um, but so all of it ties together really nicely, and I was really proud of of the design of 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 the editing process and so um yeah yeah very excited for people to read it and cool well i i appreciate that we'll definitely link to that so let's kind of jump into some other questions i know you're going to want to pull in the book and different elements of it so um so let's get at that um so when in terms of you know for me i'm i'm writing on my blog you know about stories and systems mm -hmm. but it's sort of towards an aim of of living better of working smarter yeah. it's it's something that um you know that i strive for that i want to help others do is you know this idea of flourishing yeah so my my question is when you think about that you know living better working smarter mm -hmm. you know how, how does that apply to you and and how do you apply that type of thing in in your job and your work and in your family yeah as I was thinking about that, I realized that, that that's a, a big part of my, my personality <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. is, is I, I hate either a making mistakes hmm. um, or, or at least I hate repeating the same mistake. It's like, okay. and I'm going to make a mistake I and if I don't, it. It, yeah. I, I feel like what, what was the point of that? And so for me to, one of the things that helps me live better is to intentionally um, learn from something so that I don't need to repeat that same needless, you know, mistake. Yeah. Uh, again. Um, and is that, is that tend to be around things that you're unaware that you're making that mistake or are these things that you know, you're making the mistake and you just keep failing and you just can't seem to, to figure out how to overcome it. I think it's both. It could be something as small as I realized that in our minivan, we've had three, I've, I've hit parked cars in parking lots. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> and the common denominator is my inability to make a left turn into a parking spot that Got I hit it. the <laughs> right of it. And yeah. so okay, I need to go slower and, and turn at a, you know, at not as big of an angle. Yeah. And the joke is with the kids, Hey dad, don't, don't hit a parked car. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I mean, I, I, mine's not as severe, but I hit the curb a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just, out, and I don't do it in a car, just the minivan. I don't, I don't judge the front of it. Yeah. Um, it's okay, my yeah. <laughs> but so I'm like, kind of lucky. I'm actively, you know, in a parking lot. I got to I know that I'm, I have the potential, you know, to hit cars. Yeah. I do that a little bit better. Um, but then also the, the big things um, uh, in, so like self, like knowing that I, I grew up in, in kind of a dysfunctional environment yeah. Parents divorced when I was young, mm. uh, and I I have a lot of wounds from that. Um, yeah, and those infect me, have impacted me in in my job, and then I think with my sister's death, so they lead to you making mistakes in terms of yeah. how they affect you. Yeah, and I realized that I needed to go to counseling, and I I needed mm. to go uh, to therapy. I that I'm I'm not handling myself well. It's impacting my my marriage, my children, you know, my yeah. job, um, my um, so, so from that learning that I, you know, have OCD, um, been yeah. battling that for over eight years, really realized, you know, having that diagnosis of, of yeah. disorder. And then about four years ago, um, say, uh, being diagnosed with PTSD, mm. uh, that I can't deal with the OCD until I've dealt with the trauma in my life. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, yeah. yeah so, and, and so I guess when you think about that, um, you know, cause I can relate to the, just our past, how it affects us today. And, and when we don't deal with it, 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 it takes, takes a hold of us instead of us taking a hold of it. Yeah. So, you know, how do you, how do you sort of parlay that, that desire, not just to improve yourself, but when it comes to leading others, whether it's those you work with, your family, your wife, your kids, yeah. how, how does that unfold? Like when you talk about helping others do this, the very same thing that you're, you're wanting to do for yourself. Yeah. I mean, that, and how does the book tie into that as well? You know? Oh yeah, gosh, yeah. The book, 
I mean, the for me, for me, the the book it was the beginning of that of that journey as I was going through my own healing process. Mm-hmm. Of, you know, it it opens a wound. It was really hard to write because it was opening a huge wound, and having mm-hmm. my I I asked my mom. I was like. I, I don't want to ask you to read it, but I need you to read parts of it to tell me if it's accurate, you know, and knowing that was causing, you know, her, uh, her wound. Yeah. Back to what you asked before that if, 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 if the death in your family is, is really fresh, then don't read the books. It's going to, mm. going to just rip that open. Yeah. I, I recently heard an interview that said you should wait about 18 months after a trauma before working. Yeah. You it, with it, you'll like, re-traumatize yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly what it is it's re-traumatizing yeah. it's exposing yourself with the end goal of you know providing healing but it's definitely yeah. not for someone you want to, want to hand it to a friend who just oh so yeah. nice. here's a book on yeah. um and the book actually talks about that i talk about no don't don't say cliche things you know mm. to someone who is experienced someone who's yeah the ministry of presence is really all that you can do yeah better say nothing and be there is that what you mean yeah. by that yeah yeah very much so. And, and so within that, I think leading, leading, um, and I guess lead by example as yeah. I'm a firm believer of, of if I'm going to expect, you know, my kids to behave correctly, then, then I need to behave correctly. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, um, I don't, one of the reasons that I don't cuss is because I don't want my kids to cuss mm-hmm. and I see it in their friends then and around them that yeah. they, their friends cuss and, and I'll ask them like, "What? Why are your friends saying those words?" And they're like, "Oh, they heard it, you know, from their Mom from and their dad. parents." And I'm it, like, "Like permission, almost, yeah, or yeah, implicitly." Or like they're they're told you're not allowed to say it, but I am because I'm yeah. an adult. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> hypocrisy. Okay. Like, I yeah. get that for like driving. You know, like you can't yeah. drive because you're not old enough. But yeah, I I, re- I heard something recently um, about parenting. The best, the the most. Imp- the biggest way we impact our kids is the example we lead and the example we give them. And so the best thing we can do as parents is to become the people we want our kids to become. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's why I tell tell my, (laughs) one of my, 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 one of my middle child Levi, um, I I tell him, you know what, you're, I want you to be the better version of me. Yeah. I I think that you have the ability to do that because uh, your, your environment and upbringing, um, or very similar personality wise. Yeah. Um, very, you know, very sensitive and very, and so as I'm, you know, training him and, and walking with him, I just kind of repeat that you're, you're a better version of me, Levi. Yeah. Uh, and, and I fully yeah, embrace that and believe yeah. that. So, you know, in, in our journey of life, um, one of the things that I think has a huge impact on us is just the stories that we experience, the ones we tell, the ones we hear. So I'm curious, you know, for you, whether it's something in this book or, or elsewhere, you know, what, it, what are some of the most impactful stories that you've experienced um, that really shape who you are and, and the life you live? Yeah, um, that's uh, a great question outside the, you know, the obvious um, <laughs> of dealing with, with tragedy and, yeah. and, and death. Um, I know they always say like the, there's, you know, three major uh life changes that impact a marriage is like a top five. I know death in the family is one of them. Finances impact a marriage. Yeah. Um, job change impacts a marriage. And, and um, we experienced my wife and I, you know, all, all three of those within our first year of marriage mm-hmm. you know, with, with our, our, our miscarriage. Um, that's when we moved to Colorado, got married, moved to Colorado, oh, okay. back from Colorado. Um, but, the the biggest job transition is when we moved down to Phoenix and our reason for moving down, which is all kind of personal things that um, I had originally written a lot about in the book because that's what really had impacted me personally. And the, editor, that, that transition? Yeah, the transition. Yeah. And my editor was like, you know what? To This isn't really your, for your, this is for you. This isn't really your sister's story. And I don't think it's necessary. Because I was worried about putting it in there. I didn't want to throw anyone under the bus. And she had, just said no you can leave it out it's not it's not gonna hurt the story at all well it's interesting you say that too because you know we moved from arizona to atlanta me and my wife got married and then moved over here and it was it was brutal (laughs) it was rough um and so whenever i hear someone like they move to atlanta and they're new like i immediately want to go how can i help you know (laughs) because it's very hard to leave everything you know and go somewhere new you know (laughs) yeah no it's it's tough and so 
it was one of the things that it, 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 it forced that God, why did you bring me literally to the desert? Why, why did I leave a job that, you know, was paying me well. Now I have the perspective, you know, I get it. I'm not making as much money now, you know, like yeah, all, all these, uh, Seems like town. Yeah. Was, so it was, and, and then we had a, a, our third child, Emmy, uh, born a month early. She was uh, three pounds, 11 ounces. So she was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And, um, and so I had all these, uh, I found this random teaching job working in a computer lab and you know, this is all, all in the book. Um, but it was, it was in that time period of me questioning why this horrible transition that was not like from comfort to, to like feeling like not like barely limping along, you know, yeah. was, within that is when my sister died. Mm. Um, and it was, it was that moment that I, I finally like accepted, oh, if I hadn't been here, then I wouldn't have been around my sister and I wouldn't have had these, you know, last kind of four months you know, living closer. Mm. That's where we you got, you got something you would have never had. Yeah. Exactly. But it, it, it took, I mean, obviously the worst it took, but I realized that in God's providence that he ripped me out of my comfort zone, took me to a place to where I didn't have a job that required a lot of me yeah. so that I could give all these emotional needs to a preemie baby, to my, to myself, when I lost, you know, Hannah to my family, like all these things that had, I had just a, a normal job that, um, or at least doing ministry because I was doing ministry before that, that takes a, a huge emotional yeah. attack. Um, being freed from that to carry these other burdens. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the, the revelation that I got, you know, w w within that of, okay, like God was preparing me for, you know, the worst scenario. And then, and then about a, a two months after that, I got the job where I'm at now at Northwest Christian school. Oh, wow. And, and it's like, he was like saving that for me. Yeah. Uh, and I got in right. And, and now I, I saw on your LinkedIn, you, you teach 11th grade there. Yeah. 11th grade Bible class. Okay. And the graphic design and. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'm curious, you know, you'd mentioned, I think, or your sister, I guess had originally started. She had said something when she was 14. Yeah. Yeah, it's on the, yeah, the 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 description on the back of the book is that she had told my parents that she that now I'm, now I don't want to misquote myself. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to live anymore, right? Yes, that's the quote. Yeah, yeah. So ha, when you're working with these eleven, I mean, that's that's her, right? I mean, it, maybe it's a little bit a few years before that, but yeah, I, I imagine there are kids. I mean, the the suicide rates, the just people using drugs, like just all of the. Yeah things that we get sucked into to try and survive life, cope, escape yeah. our pain that you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, how, how does this affect you as a, now a teacher? You're, you're now the person that can influence those same people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, my beginning of my journey of working with teenagers was part of that was, was Hannah and mm -hmm. going into ministry. Um, the job change was, I thought my calling was I, I could only serve teenagers in a, in a church ministry setting. Okay. So I mean, to the private Christian school, because my undergrad was in teaching. I realized, oh, I can still work with teenagers. And, and in fact, I'm getting to teach them the Bible because that's what I went yeah. to seminary for. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm kind of using most of my training and, and, and giftedness to continue to work with teenagers. Yeah. I get to take a group of, of 10 uh, students, uh, and maybe like four alumni to Cambodia on a mission trip oh, wow. um, through yeah, CIY uh, engaged in their partnership with us. Um, and so it's, it's still very much so my, my heart's mm -hmm. to, to teach, to train, to equip, to, and be present and to be available. Mm -hmm. Having students that former students come back and talk to me, I had a student um, email me saying, Hey, I read the, the free preview of the book and, and then I really relate to that. I think this would be a good book for me. Um, and so he's all God's already opening up these doors of both through the book and then and then just with my relations with students, you know, as, as they come back and they're yeah. And and this is really a a lifetime resource. I mean, that book is the way it sounds. I haven't read it yet, but it's it's a evergreen. It, it's something that in ten years is still going to be relevant. Yeah, I would. Yeah. I would so yeah, the the universal question of of what why do I suffer. Yeah. And why has God allowed this to happen to me? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, um, 
And so, and I think with them, one of, one of, one of my main mantras um, or just uh, thoughts that, that, that I draw on is that, that everyone asks the question of, you know, why, why did they have, have to die? Why did that person have to die? Yeah. Uh, and, and turning that to why am I still alive? And yeah. that's what I my sisters. It's why did she have to die, but also why did God allow me to live? Um, yeah. Why me, the regret of the survivor? Yeah. 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 And being a, uh, I didn't realize this, that, yeah, that when, when people lose someone, yeah, they call themselves survivors that I'm, mm -hmm. I, we don't just say it, you know, in a, in a formal you know, setting of I'm survived by it's I'm, I'm, I'm a survivor of someone who's lost a sibling. Yeah. And, and I describe it as a, as a club that no one, you know, wants to be in, but is forced into. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that there's, so tell me about, you know, this idea of systems, mental models, you know, what are some ways that you are able to sort of navigate these different things or navigate life or work? You know, what are some ways that you do that? Um, so you don't sort of <laughs> emotionally drain yourself or you're able to do things that maybe you couldn't do yourself. What are, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, when you, when you said, uh, when you say systems, one of the I, things that, that my mind kind of connects with is, is organizational dynamics. I, yeah. I took a, recently took a doctoral class um, on, it was an introduction to, to business administration. Yeah. With system organizational dynamics. And I don't know if I have the time or the money to, to, to finish the program, but I can only say that I took one <laughs> doctoral one class. Yeah. And, uh, but it, 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 it introduced us to all these theories of management mm. and then, exposing you to if you were to do a dissertation what area would you narrow it down to yeah and one of the was um was it's a, a psycho linguistic framework um that i've heard of it and but i didn't know it was an actual like thing i thought it was a new thing but it's not it's an old thing but it's yeah motivational language theory um mlt and 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 the guy that that kind of has been pioneering it i don't even know if he's still alive dr jeremiah uh, sullivan Okay. And, you know, what called the three rules of language and motivation theory. Yeah. And so from that, um, people have written, you know, other books and other, other dissertations and works of, of looking at the use of language in the workplace and how to motivate workers and, and realizing that, that, that you can set rules and expectations say you need to do this because you're getting paid. Yeah. Your motivation is payment. Um, that is, that is a way. And the yeah. truth, seems like the truth but the a newer way and in a better way that the, the science is proving is that if you change the way that you talk and you and you and you use motivational language to talk you can actually increase the productivity of your workers and so if you want to if you want to increase um their their health their well-being their satisfaction their desire to stay because retaining mm. employees is way better than training a new one yeah um, all cheaper. those things that, <laughs> what and cheaper as well, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, is is for the leadership to change the way that they they speak, mm -hmm. um, to include them, make them feel included in you know in in the process of, of changes. Yeah. Um, and things yeah, like and that. I, yeah, and I I think language is such a huge thing. It's it's something I I love precise language. Um, and uh, one of when I used to own a marketing company, one of the struggles I would have is as the owner. I would be talking to team members and I would say stuff where I would be thinking or ideating out loud, brainstorming. Yeah. And they're thinking, Oh, I need to go do what you're talking about. And, and like, so I, I, yeah, that wasn't what I wanted. I was like, no, no, no. So I had yeah. to learn like before I say what I'm going to say, I actually have to con sort of sandwich it in the context. Like I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. Give me your feedback. Don't act on this. Yeah. And just to realize how much our words impact people and how yeah. they and how they act is, is huge yeah and 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 even and and i think it puts some ownership on on the leaders to realize i can't just say oh you didn't do it you're you you're fired it's no it'd be to your benefit as a leader to to rethink and re reconsider so that your people that you're leading you know do better and behave better and and have an intrinsic desire to, you know, yeah. to, to and set, do everything you can as a leader to set them up for success. So if they fail, it's their own choice. It's not 
yeah an outside force yeah and i think another dynamic within that is realizing the language that i say to myself mm -hmm. um yeah how to myself and that's kind of been a new a new ground for me to walk on i always know that i have this kind of negative self-talk and you know i get that through counseling but we're looking <laughs> at, at this uh at the okay how am i going to lead others realizing oh this could work on myself <laughs> yeah and how you know the things that i that i i speak you know am i am i actually speaking truth to myself yeah and it's sometimes just writing down what am i telling myself so i can see it on paper yeah yeah it's yeah. it. <laughs> like i if writing things out for sure you get a clear idea of oh i didn't realize that that's exactly what i know what yeah. i was what I was thinking about nails it nails the jello to the wall. So, all right, well, let's, I know uh, we got to close out here. So, you know, tell you know, life is hard. There's wonderful moments. There's tragic moments. Yeah. You know, what are your, your final words of wisdom for, for those that are listening or watching this or reading it? Yeah. Um, my final words are, there's an awesome book written by this guy named Matthew J Diaz. Yeah. Last day of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's going to be a digital copy too. I just got to wait for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Combo. <laughs> uh, two for, um, I, I, I think that, um, I think that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Yeah. Like personality types too, that I have to be better. I, I have to do this. I have, you know, like, um, and, and I think that, what we fail to realize is that I think God sets up all these like system and boundaries and, and rules. Yeah. He knows that that's what's going to mm. make you better. Yeah. Um, and one of, one of those, those systems um, is, is this kind of this, this connected relationship with, you know, with, with him. Yeah. And, and that you can start to know yourself and understand yourself and your, and your calling and your, and your purpose and your why and the how, as you continue to engage in, in, in your relationship with, with, with the creator. Yeah. Um, and, and, and doesn't necessarily mean that, that it needs to be Christianity for everyone. Um, but for those that are Christians and, and believe it and, and, and cling to it, I would, my, my message to, to them would be, if you really believe that, that what Jesus said, yeah. uh, you can't do it apart from him. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's looking for something yeah. and, and it's something to lean on, you know, something that I ha once had a friend tell me in high school, wow, it must've, you know, it must be nice to have, a, have a crutch, you know, <laughs> kind of dogging my face. That's how he saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized I'm like, well, everyone has a crutch. Like you're, yeah. you're assuming you don't have a crutch or you're arrogant enough to think you don't have one. Yeah. Um, Everyone, everyone's leaning on something. Everyone has it. Has it's, it's part of being in a, in a broken, fallen world. And, yeah. Uh, and if if we think the world's getting better, then I, I haven't haven't seen that yet, and I haven't seen it in history. You know. Yeah, like and, we ha suffer from the same ailments as our ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's nothing new. Uh, Even uh, if I'm, we sanitize it now, it's yeah. <laughs> at the rate it's the same. Yeah. We're creating we're creating new superbugs, right? With the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. So uh, how, how do people? Did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, um, so tell us, you know, how, how can people get the book? Where can they meet you online? What are you up to? Uh, you know, how can they connect with you? Tell us. Yeah, tell us. I'll like put some I, links in the blog post uh, as well. Yeah, if you look up Matthew J. Diaz or, or kind of my, my nickname, Matt Joe yeah. Diaz, is how I've hyphened some of the things over time on Facebook. Yeah. You can also Google Last Day of Regret and Facebook, Instagram. Started at Pinterest. Yeah. Uh, didn't realize that that there's a whole section for quotes. Okay. So, oh well, I, I wrote a bunch of quotes. Yeah. And, and people will like them. Yeah. <laughs> or they yeah. Them. There are things to share. Yeah. And so I've been doing that and running ads on that, and I've gotten like way more, you know, way more feedback than than than. That's Facebook. awesome. Like, yeah, that's a good idea. $10 Pinterest goes in an hour, and yeah. ten dollars Facebook's been taking you know like ten days to get through. And <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. They have the different algorithms, but I don't yeah. know. So. Yeah, you can find me on. You can find the book on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the pub, publisher Westbow Press. Yeah. Um, hopefully, the digital copy, um, which is which is cheaper. Um, yeah. But I get, I get more money from it, the digital copy on Amazon than I do the physical copy. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, like, <laughs> they have different third party seller, but yeah. All right. Well, we'll put links to those. And thank you so much, uh, Matt, for uh, for.
for your uh, time and sharing yeah. and wish we could do more, but, uh, but this will be a good, good starter for now and people can read yeah. the book if they want more details, right? It was so good seeing you and, and thank you for reaching out and, and we'll, we'll be in touch. All right. Sounds good. You have a good day. Thanks, Jason.